which faction is the right faction for you. I wanted to create this video as a brief summary for all the different factions in the Warhammer series, uh, Total War that is, of course, and describe their strengths, weaknesses, and sort of their play style on both the battlefield and on the campaign map. As I know when I first came over to the Warhammer series for Total War, I was uh, really excited, really, really excited. Uh, but because there's so much different variety, I had no idea where to start. And so what I want to do here is I want to do just a nice little summary of each and every faction, kind of how they play, so that you can decide for yourself which faction you should perhaps start with or perhaps try, you know, on the next campaign roll. And then later on, what I'll do is actually make a dedicated video for each and every faction, going into a lot more detail on exactly the specifics of how they play, uh, again, on both the battlefield and the campaign map, talk about the strategies that I found to work better, talk about some of the strategies that I did not find to work all that well, and give a, give a much more in-depth overview there. But for this video right here, it is going to be the brief summary of each and every of each and every faction starting off with number one the high elves now of course what would a fantasy game be without your stock standard elven faction no this is the high elves of course right here and they have their own unique identity in the warhammer universe as they feel like a very elite army their costs to recruit are certainly higher comparatively to most other factions and their unit sizes reflect their their identity as well as they're smaller they reflect that they are elite units that cost more but pound for pound they perform excellently on the battlefield they have a decent staying power on the front line they're not like the super uh super high powered front line um faction they do obviously have the lothran sea guard which can act as both ranged and and a front line in a sense which people typically do spam which is kind of funny um there's also of course the phoenix guard that's your that's your traditional kind of bigger uh halberd unit that has a little bit more staying power a little bit more elite as well of course and then what's typically backing up this army is very very powerful um very very powerful ranged units such as the sisters of avalon perhaps some of the best uh, ranged units in the game maybe bar the uh, may, uh, maybe bar the wood elves of course it's always the elves and then of course the most eclectic combination of dragons and eagles here as well now eagles i'm not a huge fan of but the dragons are amazing and they do have the most the most diverse group of dragons available to them in fact they have the most powerful ones in the game i believe as well on top of that they do have some some artillery although it's certainly nowhere near a top tier artillery i'd say it's certainly near the bottom of the tiers of artillery uh in these eagle claw bolt throwers they're serviceable especially in the early game and then the 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 faction is rounded out by extremely strong cavalry units they have these silver helms which are very very cost effective as um as shock cavalry and have some damn good st uh, staying power in battle as well. And then perhaps some of the best cavalry in the game in these Dragon Princes. Now, of course, there's there's several other factions that have very, 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 very strong cavalry. These ones, I do put them as a top tier unit, as they are incredibly elite. They are very costly, but they but but they but they justify that with their performance on the battlefield. So this faction is best if you like a little bit more of a defensive play style, as they naturally kind of get forced into that with their very powerful archers, but also also, they do have the, um, they, you know, they do, they, they can take the initiative as well with that very, with those very powerful cav units and flying units as well, kind of supporting them. So they are pretty good at harassing, skirmishing around, and then that yes, they can hold their front, their uh, their own in the front line as well. Like I said, their play style is a little bit slower um, on the on both the battlefield and the campaign map, and you will find yourself waiting a little bit more. However, they are a relatively easier faction to pick up, um, but of course, with any faction, you know, hard easy to pick up hard to master and they pretty much fit the bill on all fronts except for the artillery except you know but even then they you know they get the job done number two the lizard men what picture could sum up the good old lizards better than a prehistoric massive dinosaur perhaps even one of the most powerful in this game at this point in the year 2020 and the lizard men are very unique in the sense that they actually have very heavy armor right from the start in this kind of in the same way that the dwarves do but they play a little bit differently this is is more of a, ra a rush faction with extremely strong infantry units supported by some of the most strongest uh, monsters in the game as well. 
Now, of course, they do have a few ranged units, but they serve a different purpose in an army like this, such as uh, the Skinks over here. Where are they at? I believe they're right here. Yes, indeed, they are. And they they serve more of a skirmish purpose rather than like the High Elves, for example, which just kind of pelt you from, from down range with, uh, with arrows nonstop. These guys, their purpose is to essentially get the, on, the enemy on their back foot by, by going up, being aggressive with skirmishing, and then the front line can take advantage of any sort of, you know, mistakes that the enemy might make from being rushed a little bit. Now, this faction, like I said, doesn't really have any, any like, of the traditional range. They do have kind of what works as artillery in one of these uh, Stegodons who has a massive solar engine on his back. I believe he's right here or somewhere around here. Yes, indeed, that's him. Um, but they don't, but they do lack the same artillery that a lot of the other more powerful uh, factions have that have a lot more range capabilities. This faction is really intended to run. That's where they shine. They do an incredibly jo good job at it, perhaps one of the best, and that is their strength. They do have okay cav not the best but serviceable good enough to run down um routing units they do have some unique units as well with these salamander hunting packs and then these flying pterodons over here which can harass units as well so their main their main mission is to go out skirmish pull pull the enemy into bad engagements and then absolutely punish them with incredibly uh, powerful frontline units. They're one of the few factions that actually starts off pretty much with turn one with units that you could probably use until the end of the game. And that is, of course, the good old Saurus Warriors with shields. And they are damn good. Heavy armor, high health, a lot of staying power, they and a lot of killing power as well. And then they even get some of the most powerful frontline units in the whole game in the Temple Guard, which I am looking for right now. There they are. Some of the best frontline units in the game, perhaps maybe even the best. Extremely heavy armor, extreme killing power, and they can absolutely hold their own from start to finish as a phenomenal frontline unit. Um, of course, this faction on the campaign map does play a little bit, you know, plays pretty similarly to most other stock standard factions in the sense that, you know, you do your empire building and everything. Um, however, they, their, 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 their economy is certainly not a strength. They don't have the strongest economy. They don't have the worst economy, but where they kind of shine is in their battle capabilities. They have incredibly strong frontline units for a, ver a very decent price. And then, of course, their monsters are some of the best, some of the most in the game as you can see right here who doesn't want to relive Jurassic Park and smash some uh, some T-Rex looking type units into some front lines and as I said before they even have perhaps I believe the strongest unit in the whole game and that is the Dread Saurian right here a newer unit and um, and they do and they do a damn good job on the battlefield also they actually have some pretty strong magic as well so they do well in that department and overall a damn good starting faction i would say the one kind of drawback is lack of artillery lack of traditional range and lack of you know you know of a good starting economy but other than that they're very mobile they're very rush oriented and a damn damn good time to play Number three, the Dark Elves. The Dark Elves are perhaps actually one of my favorite factions in Warhammer. It's the first faction that I really played, and they are damn good in this game. The first unit that you see right here, these are, of course, the Dark Shards with shields, and they are incredibly powerful. Another one of those units that you kind of start off with, and they're actually kind of serviceable even into the, uh, especially the mid game, but even the late game, even the late game, they are pretty damn good as well. The Dark Elves are like High Elves, but with a tan. No, <laughs> no, no. No, 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 not like that. But they are basically like e evil, evil high elves in a sense. And their whole MO in kind of the way that they differentiate themselves from high elves is that they don't have as much armor. They don't have as much staying power, but they do have more killing power. They're very momentum based, uh, both on the battlefield and actually on the campaign map as well. Their economy can be actually one of the best, only maybe outshined by one other faction in this game, which we'll get to later. But the dark elves do have a uh, a completely unique mechanic with their economy in the sense that they can take slaves so the way that it works is that when you when you when you beat another army or when you take another capital or or anything for that matter you have the option to take slaves rather than you know execute them or ransom them off or anything like that and with that you can start you can sort of you know uh, differentiate and specialize cities to deal with slaves so that their economy just gets absolutely 
catastrophically humongous, which is just which is really, 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 really fun, but does keep up the momentum basis of that because there is kind of like a ticking time bomb mechanic where those slaves kind of uh, fall by the wayside, I suppose. They, I, I don't really know what happens to them. That's not explained uh, in the game, but, uh, but they go away, we'll say. Anyways, the Dark Elves don't really have any real weaknesses. They have good monsters. They have very scary monsters. Uh, of course, a Black Dragon, even a Mana Core Radon over there. But what is newer with them is this Charybdis, which is a total monster killer, so they can deal with that quite well. They have, of course, the lovely, <laughs> the lovely five-headed Hydra over here. The War Hydra is its name, smashing into front lines. And the Dark Elves do very well from range with these Dark Shards and Shades, some of the best units, uh, some, sorry, some of the best um, armor-piercing units in the game. And again, they get them pretty much on start on, on turn number one. That's for the Dark Shards, not the Shades there much later. Um, the Shades are quite interesting and quite fun to use as well, as they are good both from range and actually uh, up close as well. They can both melee and, and do ranged. And then the Dark Elves, if they do have one weakness, it is with their Cavalry. They don't really, they do have Cavalry, but it's not particularly strong. It's not particularly strong at all. In fact, I'd say it's, I, I, I don't really ever mess with them at all. Maybe sometimes a Doomfire uh, Warlocks, but... Um, but for the most part, uh, the cavalry is certainly uh, a weak point in comp compared to other compared to other races. Of course, they do have some pretty damn strong uh, lords with very, 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 very powerful magic. Of course, Malekith being one of them. Their chariots are okay, but they do suffer from um, from from issues with uh, with rampaging, which is what you typically get with these cold one units. Yes, they do have some normal chariots as well. Those can be used too, but it's not a strength for this uh, for this army. Neither is their artillery in the same way that the high elves do not have strong artillery they do have artillery of course which is which is great um but this this faction certainly plays a lot more aggressively than the high elves for example they like to rush they like to get the enemy on their back foot they like to they like to win the flanking engagement and use these strong frontline units which aren't which aren't the best frontline units they will get you know they uh they will get uh, beat by the more powerful factions on the front line like uh, like what we just looked at with the lizardmen but they can hold their own especially that being the black guard of nagarond you know uh, uh what's his name uh malekith's personal guard himself and then of course the serviceable black air black arc corsairs which are not the best frontline unit if anything they do kind of lack in that department but they make up with it with killing power they also have a mechanic in the battlefield where if they get a certain amount of kills it'll fill up a meter i think it might even be here uh no it's actually not right there all right yes it is at the top here but you probably can't see it due to my uh overlay there um but after a certain amount of kills after the battle's been going on for a little bit of time they actually get some pretty massive buffs which really 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 helps the snowball and momentum effect so this faction is very fun to use especially on the battlefield they don't have any major glaring obvious issues there's they're they're strong everywhere with a particular strength in their ranged units actually especially their starting ones um, but they don't have as much range so that is where they lack a little bit on their range units there's a little bit of a drawback with these dark shards but they do have armor piercing which is humongously useful especially when the game is first getting going because you know usually usually factions will kind of lack uh, that armor piercing power at the beginning well these guys have it right from the start and, and like I said, they're serviceable until the very end as well. They have some pretty fun uh, killing units over here in these Sisters of Slaughter, very scantily clad as well, so they're fun to look at. And they are a unique faction in that sense that they combine, you know, kind of gla uh, glass cannon type tactics, but also with some decent monsters as well. Number four the Skaven, the good old rats. I've actually fallen in love with these rats a lot more than I ever thought I would, as uh, I never really had too much inter interest in this faction until I played an It Kit Claw campaign. Now, this faction is 100% unique. They have not only different mechanics on the battlefield, but also certainly on the campaign section as well. But on the battlefield, they perform incredibly well from range. They have some of the best ranged units, both in artillery, both in their missile units, and even some, some amazing monsters as well which is actually really, really fun to use. Where they lack, obviously, is their front line. They use their front line in the same way that World War I used their front line, basically as cannon fodder, basically as complete, complete meat shields in the formation of these Skaven slaves. They have extremely high numbers. They are, they are numerous. They are certainly not, they don't have that same elite feeling that you get from the High Elves, but that's not what they're about. They're about ranged firepower. These, what, what appear to be snipers, right? 
right here. They're Jezails. They are some of the best ranged units for sniping out high value targets, you know, monsters, especially on the other team. They have incredible artillery, both with these Death Glob Bombardiers, or I don't know if they actually count as artillery, but they do essentially fire an artillery barrage. And of course, the Warp Light Cannons, plus the Plague Claw Catapults, all amazing units anchored by some pretty damn impressive war machines as well. They have basically what are called Doom Flares, which are essentially rats with motorcycles. <laughs> very, 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 very annoying to deal with on the front line if you're an enemy. Very fun to use if you are the Skaven. They, of course, have... They, of course, have uh, the Poison Wind, uh, wind Globadiers, which are just, you know, essentially more sort of Mortar units uh, that have to get a little bit closer, but still pretty damn, you know, you know, pretty damn good. And, of course, the Warp Fire Throwers, that is their strength, ranged firepower, plus just a very, 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 very cheap front line, which is pretty much only intended to die, to busy the enemy with killing them because, you know, they kind of have to deal with them. And then the range just gets in, does the work, does all the killing, while the front line is essentially a meat shield now they do have some good skirmish options as well they are rather fast uh, being rats uh, with both these slingers and night runners over here and, uh, and, and and even their front line is so damn fast that you can actually catch the the enemy off in some very bad engagements if you're clever with it but this faction on the campaign map also plays incredibly different as well also uh, perhaps before we get into that I should mention one of the mo one of the most devious chariot units in the game the doom wheel just absolutely decimates front lines when they get in there and of course some nasty rat ogres and let's actually before we get into the campaign section as well let's look at maybe one of the weirdest monsters in the game like a seven headed rat i think it is i don't know there's like one two three four five six seven plus some claws this guy obviously had a very interesting frankenstein-ish type upbringing I, I guess uh very very interesting units nonetheless now on the campaign map they do have some different mechanics they are actually bounded by a food mechanic kind of similar to older warhammer games in the same way that you know you'd have to manage your foods in order to support an army i actually do like that man mechanic quite a bit some people complain about it some people do not do not enjoy it i think it adds a good dynamic to this faction because otherwise you're just going to be creating armies of of, of just infinite amounts of skaven slaves because they, they're pretty much costless and you can use, as, use them as meat shields while again the back line does all the damage but that means in the campaign map you do have another another thing to worry about in terms of not just you know your your cost per turn but also your economy and then of course the happiness and then now you have this to deal with as well which you know adds a little bit more complexity to it which is why i think a lot of people are turned off by this faction because you know you have a few more things to be aware of at, at, you know up front but at the end of the day for the more experienced player or for the person who's willing to take on a little bit more of a challenge this faction has uh, definitely uh rewards the player for 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 learning it it has some of the best killing power especially from ranged and again the weak points of course is the front line but they mediate that by just having significant more numbers and a very low cost for that and they don't really they're not really too high cost anyways they and they also have some pretty damn good killing units on the front line as well not the best but but pretty damn good definitely serviceable in these monk sensor bears which are very very scary looking by the way when you get up close and then even their more elite units on the front line um they're not the best front line units but they but they can hold their own mostly because they just have so much so many numbers these storm vermin over here fulfill that role and then also the the ones with hal uh, halbrids uh, can can anchor as well and hold a, and have a little bit more staying power in the front line. Of course, your stock standard clan rats are going to be your mainstay of the army alongside the slaves. The, that's that's your main meat shield, typically speaking. And then it is time for the range to just go to work. Number five, the Vampire Coast. Now, the Vampire Coast is actually a very unique faction in many ways. They are a faction that is incredibly focused on on gunpowder. For one, they're perhaps only gunpowder you could say they have very few frontline units and their frontline units are really not even frontline units of, of course they do fulfill that purpose but the thing is is that what you'll typically find yourself using as a front line is actually these monsterish kind of uh crabs right here with zombies on top of them that's the name of the game for these guys they're very slow they have very low mobility but they can absolutely make up that with some of the best firepower from downrange this cannon right here the queen bess is i think the best piece of singular artillery in the whole damn game it does a massive amount of damage 
which can absolutely destroy formations in just one in, in just one hit and has the range that pretty much spans the whole map the faction is also anchored by some pretty damn strong monsters these these massive rotting prometheans over here or cra or humongous crabs as you might call them uh do a damn good job of that extremely high health extremely high armor and very 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 good at holding their own they do not have much killing power in the front line however that is their main drawback if you consider that a drawback but do you need killing power in the front line when you have a half human half ship that has massive cannons for hands maybe not in fact they have so much firepower and so much range with it that they that they typically that they typically make out pretty damn good with that and even their frontline units i do find most use for these for, you know for these zombies on top of the crabs which have a decent amount of health they're actually not very high in number and they do have some more traditional units right here like your depth guard but they are so small in number they are elite of course but they are small in number and the sense and and, and i get the sense that um that actually the better units to kind of be holding the enemy off are actually mostly mostly these crab units and then just stack the deck gunners behind them stack the artillery behind them and punish them from afar they do have a damn good selection of monsters so they will employ the fear tactics as well or terrify the enemy um, and they can do some decent amount of harassing as well like the only real mobility that they have is actually uh, you know scurvy dogs and then these bats and then and then funnily enough these deck droppers that are essentially these these long-range units with guns like these zombies in the fists of these uh, flying bats over here that can that can move around quite quickly and so that's about the extent of the uh, of the mobility of this army they do have some good frontline uh, disruptors as well with those morn goals and then of course some killing power with the sirens in the front in the front line as well although I very rarely find myself using them they have a very interesting uh, campaign in the sense that you know because you are a faction that's essentially based as vampire pirates in a sense um you can kind of pick and choose your battles by sailing around to any part of the world that you want to go to so in that way they kind of get to you know pick and choose who they want to go against and for the most part this faction is pretty damn fun to play i would say um However, if you're not a fan of gunpowder, this would not be the faction for you. And, of course, their front line is completely meat shields as well. Now, being a vampire faction, they do have a little bit of a different um, uh, mechanic with how they uh, maintain leadership on the, on, the, on the battlefield. They do not have, you know, the standard leadership um, that you see in just about any of their army that's not undead. What they have is binding, so they actually don't get tired or anything like that. But they do, uh, but they do lose their binding, which kind of acts as a similar thing. Number six, the Tomb Kings, another piece of DLC, just like the Vampire Coast, and perhaps one of the best ones in my opinion as well. In fact, I do have a video on that. But more importantly, how do these guys play? They are phenomenal from the monster department. They call them constructs in this uh, in this particular army, and they're anchored by you know mostly a meat shield front line. They do their job. They hold in there. They have high numbers on the front line, specifically with these Tomb Guard right here. But mostly you're going to be dealing with, especially the uh, the, the 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 regular old skeleton now they don't have very good range they do they do have ranged options of course but it's just you know they're very stock standard just your traditional skeleton archers right here and for some actual monster killing they do have these units i can't quite say their name <laughs> every time that i try i feel like i mess it up but the ushpati uh, with the great bows doing pretty well at that where this army really shines is their options with disrupting the front line so the way that they play is they get their front lines kind of met up with the enemy with typically the tomb guard or the skeleton warriors they have again they have high numbers and they have decent staying power and then they have their monsters of which you see one right here or they're called constructs again and this guy over here smash into the front lines and disrupt the enemy while also having some pretty good options from ranged as well actually i should get through their front line uh, disruptors as well uh first we see the scorpion unit right here very very terrifying and uh and another construct right here the hero titan although not the best on the front line he's more of a hero killer these guys are amazing on the front line and they actually do have a mechanic where they can summon them in campaign uh intra game kind of in the same way that the dark elves do as well so they get stronger over time now their ranged options are actually uh, surprisingly very good. This casket of souls right here with the little bugs flying around it, <laughs> is, uh, which also terrifies my girlfriend, which is kind of funny, um, does a damn good job from downtown. And of course, their, 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 their standards, uh, I believe they're skull catapults, is that their name? 
uh, uh, Screaming Skull Catapults. That's that, that's right. Uh, do a pretty damn good in their own right as well. So that's the way that they play. They have they have pretty damn good artillery. They don't have too many options, but they, but but the options that they do have are very good. And then their constructs are numerous and very much specialized for taking out enemy front lines. And also, as we saw with the Hero Titan, that is perhaps one of the best hero killers in the game. They also have one of the most unique ranged units. I don't necessarily count this as artillery, although some people might. And that is this massive bone giant right here. He has the range that can basically hit almost anything on the map and punish it with some pretty damn good killing power but he's a little bit more specialized towards 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 just hitting one singular target so he's best used against um for example uh you know another enemy hero or something like that a big target typically nonetheless other than that this 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 faction has probably mo one of the most uh, unique campaign mechanisms in the sense that they actually don't pay anything for their recruitment of this army oh and i forgot to mention they also have some pretty damn good uh, uh, units for um, for harassing uh, Cav with as well, or what kind of acts as their Cav? Uh, these these Scrapotro stalkers is what I'm trying to say. Um, pretty damn good at that. I uh, can definitely hold their own. Um, so yes, on the campaign map, they have a completely different, uh, completely different mechanic in the sense that they pay nothing for their armies. Their armies are bound by soul to their, to whoever their legendary lord is. In this case, we have Ark in the Black right there. Pretty damn good in and of its own right. Um, so they actually don't pay anything. So that means that you can, you can raise up armies very easily however they do have to pay money for the buildings that allow that recruitment so any any unit that's outside of your like your very basic units like your skeleton warriors your skeleton archers is going to be capped by the amount of buildings that are specific to that unit so for example there's a building that allows you to recruit this unit right here our necro sphinx but if you only have one of those buildings and you can only build so many of these next things maybe I, I think it's like two maybe um and if you build more of those buildings then you can build more of the necro sphinx you can you can recruit more of them but the thing is is that their economy is absolute trash maybe one of the worst economies singularly speaking in the game so getting those new buildings is actually quite quite difficult but that's essentially how they play and they are damn fun damn unique and they certainly have their own their own art style as well these guys over here also pretty fun to snipe out enemy heroes and overall this is a great faction that doesn't really have any any like major weaknesses there that you know they have speed when they need speed they have decent staying power in the front line they have amazing uh constructs aka monsters and pretty damn good ranged options as well so they are very very versatile in the way that you want to play them and i strongly 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 suggest picking up this dlc Number seven, the Empire. The Empire is the epitome of the jack of all trades. They they have good options everywhere, but they don't have any particularly standout options, except for maybe some of their cav. Actually, their cav is pretty damn decent. Their front line is typically composed of you know he, you know units that don't necessarily have the heaviest of armor. They don't have the most killing power or anything like that, but they do have decent numbers and they stay in there well enough. But they're not going to win you the battle on the front line. Their strongest unit there is probably the great swords and even they have pretty lackluster uh, armor options they do not have a shield I believe and more importantly this this army is really anchored by heavy heavy artillery which does a damn good job they have more tours in the back which absolutely punish the enemy they have some of these very unique units with these hell blaster volley guns and also these hell blaster rocket rocket batteries and of course your great cannons as well and then even a tank which all these units are pretty damn good in fact if i did have to say where you know a couple areas where they do stand out it's with both their 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 artillery options as well as their cavalry options that's where they do damn well they do have some very serviceable um, uh, range units in the formation of their archers and their uh, and their handgunners with particular interest to their handgunners they obviously have crossbows as well which are actually pretty damn good the good thing about them is is that they get them early so they're very well rounded they are a very fun faction to play and on the campaign map, they're probably the most standard um, uh, faction in comparison to like past uh, Total War games, in the sense that uh, you know you are pretty damn familiar with you know with with with, with what building kind of does what. They're the most recognizable faction, being that they're the only humans in this game, or at least uh, well, unless you consider Norska humans. Um, but overall, they play pro or probably they have the best translation from some of the other Total War games into the Warhammer series. Now, like I did say, they're 
their their cavalry is some of the best in the game they do have these demigriff knights which are absolutely amazing they have incredible staying power they have incredible killing power as well they can take down uh they can take down monsters they can take down they can take down just about anything really and then they also have some pretty damn good options that are a little bit lower tier not as good as the demis but the demis are you know some of the best units in the game in these rice guards right here and then also these Knights Panther right here, both very, 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 very strong units, especially seeing that, you know, you get them relatively early on in the game. And they also do have damn good staying power. They are certainly more heavily armored than a lot of the frontline units, and they will do a lot of the early killing alongside the range units right here. They also do have perhaps one of the most bizarrely unuseful units ever <laughs> and that is this war wagon i don't understand why this is in the game uh but it's fun to look at i just don't really think it does anything all that well it's like kind of a half chariot half ranged unit but it doesn't really do a good job at either and then they also have a very bizarre um a chariot type unit as well in the limerick of height of hish heish Maybe I'm saying that improperly. Uh, kind of has, you know, a ranged weapon, but I, I haven't really found too much of a use for that one either. Perhaps someone in the comment section could let me know what they like to use it for. But other than that, very, 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 very well-rounded. Does a good job everywhere. It doesn't necessarily shine in any particular direction, except for if I had to say one thing, it's definitely the uh, definitely the cavalry and and to a lesser extent the um, the range units as well, of which they have a lot of options over there, of course. And their starting units are serviceable. They're not they're not amazing, but they are good. So if you're looking for an easy translation from any of the other historical Total War games, this is probably a good faction to start off with and you'll pick it up relatively quickly. Number eight, the dwarves. The dwarves from a fantasy standpoint are always a heavily armored and more defensive minded type faction. This one, no different than that. They have some of the best frontline units maybe in the game. I would actually even say that they have the best defensive frontline for sure in the game in the form of the iron breakers. Let's see if we can find them right here really quickly. Where are you iron breakers? I see you somewhere. There they are. There they are. Some of the best, most heavily, uh, heavily armored units in the whole game. They will stay in there. They do, they pretty much do exactly what their name implies they do not break and they are damn good uh, for the rest of the army it is mostly comprised of incredibly heavy heavily armored units and then very 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 punishing um, backline artillery units and some good uh, some good options for the range units as well in these rangers and coralers and also some some sort of torpedo units as well as what they're called although uh, they're, they're, uh, they're referred to in the game as Iron Drakes. They're called, or sorry, but they act as a torpedo unit, which is completely different than any, than any other unit that I've seen. They also have flamethrowers as well, but their main MO is punish the enemy from, from a distance while holding in the front line with incredibly high leadership and high armor, and they do that very well. If you like the defensive play style, this is the faction that's probably best to try. Um, if you enjoyed the Empire, but you didn't really care for the cavalry options there, or you didn't really find yourself using them all that much, this would be a good next step towards finding a more optimized faction for yourself. And I'd say that their frontline units from the get-go, or just their, their beginning units from the get-go, are pretty much serviceable the whole game, especially the Dwarf Warriors. Maybe not so much the Dwarf Miners, although they're not bad. They still do have some pretty heavy armor, especially for starting units you know, for turn one units, but the Dwarf Warriors hold their own pretty much until the end of the game. The Longbeards also kind of, a, you know, a step up above that, I suppose, also bringing their own leadership buffs, and realistically, their mobility is certainly a hindrance, but they do have some options to deal with that in the form of these gyrocopters right here. Not the best, certainly not certainly not a mobile faction, but if you like the defensive sort of play style and you like lots of, uh, lots of options for artillery, whether it be these bolt throwers right here, whether it be your traditional catapults right here and the grudge throwers and then of course the great cannons right here amaze uh, you know ama or just regular cannons for uh for taking out singular targets or these absolute frontline decimator organ guns and flame cannons right here or flame uh what, it, what are they officially called Fl yeah the flame cannon um this is the this is the faction to give that a go the one other thing that they also lack massively is of course cavalry units they don't have any of that and they also don't have magic either as well but they do have a lot of buffs from their from their leaders and incredibly high leadership to the boot um on top of that their campaign is pretty standard if you're familiar with total war games but where they do certainly shine is their economy i think that they have maybe the best economy in the game number nine the greenskins the greenskins are actually 
rather similar to the Empire in the sense that they're very well rounded, although they do have a much different play style in a sense. What do I mean by that? Well, first off, they have access to monsters, as you can see right here, a pretty scary one right in front of your very face, and also some trolls over here, and of course, even a massive giant in the background over there. But the way that they play different than the Empire, for example, is the fact that they have much more greater numbers, whereas the Empire is a little bit more kind of in the middle ground, I suppose. This one kind of overwhelms with just a wide di wide diversity of all different types of units, but also just a wide army in general. They can get the surround on very easily against any other army because they are both fast and their numbers are humongous, and they have options all the way around. Now, none of their options really stand out as like the best for example but they do stand out in the sense that they're you know they're decent they're serviceable however one major drawback for this army they have very poor leadership comparatively speaking especially if they're if their war boss dies it's over baby they are they're, they're going to be running now they do tend to break and come back several times in a battle that's completely normal if you're not used to that sort of play style probably not the faction for you but they do have some very interesting options especially Especially in the uh, in the cavalry department, they have a lot of units that can poison other units. They have a lot of mobility here with these spider riders. They have a lot of mobility with the wolf riders. I think maybe over here is where they are. Yes, indeed. So they can get surrounding options and they can pick and choose their engagements very well. They also do have some decent options for artillery and, and even chariot units as we were just looking at right there but the artillery units they have they have a very unique one right here actually the doom diver catapult i believe it is which kind of launches a lone goblin in there at the enemy army and it's kind of like a guided missile so they pretty much never miss they have extreme accuracy and they do a decent amount of damage as well and then they also have you know your stock standard uh rock lubber i believe it is just your you know your traditional catapult so this army pretty damn good overall very well rounded they do have some pretty impressive units on the front line in the Black Orcs, which have good numbers and also very good killing power and relatively heavily armored. Um, however, like I said, they don't really have any one particular area that they shine at. They, 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 they essentially overwhelm the enemy with good units, get good matchups, and play a little bit more aggressively. There's certainly not a defensive um, army, as these guys, <laughs> these guys are ready for battle right now, it looks like. <clears throat> they're certainly not a defensive army um and they do play rather well on the on the battlefield but they are in need actually of a major update of which we're hoping this one is the next major update this video being recorded in may of the year 2020 so hopefully by the time that this is out uh you actually have that update and a few of the few of the issues will be fixed up their economy is okay not great i wouldn't even say it's good it's just okay it does, certainly doesn't shine and they do have issues with sort of infighting and whatnot as well. They have a different mechanic called fightiness in the campaign map, which essentially is... Essentially, it's kind of like a war fervor type mechanic where if the longer that they're not in battle, the more that their fightiness will go down It's is it's what it's called. And if their fightiness goes too far down, then what will, what will actually happen is like the same thing as when you need to decimate um, uh, an army in some of the prior games like Attila or Rome 2 when the, uh, I th I th what, what is exactly, the integrity factor gets a little bit too low. That's kind of the same thing for fightiness. So you do have to kind of remain in a more momentous kind of battle stance essentially and and kind of keep on the aggressive front so they do pay, play aggressive both on the battlefield and in the campaign map and you're also rewarded if you do keep it really really high if you get the fightiness all the way to the top level i think it's 100 then you'll actually be rewarded with what's called a war a war a wog a war <laughs> which is great because it basically summons um it some it, it summons a full stack unit right next to your main army and they will attack whatever you decide to attack so it's basically like uh it's basically like an extra support with a you know a decent sized army so it adds a different dynamic to it and for that reason this faction is it you know plays unique in that way on both the campaign map um not necessarily as much on the on the battle map but they are very fun to use and they do have some pretty damn punishing monsters as well Number 10, the Vampire Counts. The Vampire Counts are a beautiful faction that has complete meat shield type throwaway front lines in the formation of typically these skeleton units right here, and then pulverize them with very scary and very powerful monsters, of which the Vampire Counts have many. They also have significant access to magic, of which you will need to use it a bunch. So this faction does require a lot more micromanagement skill, in my opinion, and there's also one major drawback to this faction, if, if this is a drawback for you, and that is the fact that there is 
absolutely no range. They don't have any archers. They don't have anything that has any missile units or, 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 or options, but they do have very good mobility and some of the best actual uh, cavalry options in the game in the form of these blood knights over here or maybe they're over here some somewhere on this map they are anyways they do have some of the best there so they're very highly mobile they re they're very reliant on magic and also monsters and the front line you can't you know if you fall in love with your units these are not the ones to fall in love with of course the zombies as well complete meat shields and what's actually very cool and unique about their lords is that they can actually even summon up their own their own units of um of typically zombies or skeleton warriors or something like that something to that effect they also do have better options for the front line in these grave guard units right here you'll notice stats wise they're actually not as good as just about any of the other uh any of the other factions higher tier units but that's because the lord himself whoever the lord is typically has some sort of buff for the front line or they also might have a corpse card or something like that that'll rejuvenate their front lines as well which is also specific to this faction so this faction again heavily reliant on fear monsters and mobility with their with their excellent cavalry and oh there they are right there beautiful and also very very powerful legendary lords however where they lack is obviously uh no range at all that's both artillery or or just even simple missile units uh you know like an archer unit they have absolutely none of that but extremely high, holy, uh, highly mobile. Now, on the campaign map, they have uh, they have some different uh, mechanics as well in the sense that you can do what's called raising the dead. So what that means is that you can actually instantly recruit a unit of, um, of, uh, uh, of undead um, with your legendary lord pretty much, uh, you know, assuming that you have enough sort of uh, uh, momentum built up pretty much at any time. And if you have a more powerful battle, or sorry, not a more powerful battle, but if you have a big battle on the campaign map and a lot of units die, it'll actually allow you to cre recruit more powerful units from that raised dead mechanic. Now, you still do pay for it, and their economy is, is gutter. It's terrible. It's bad. Um, but the fact is is that they have very very uh good access to cheap units to use as these front lines and then they have very powerful monsters kind of mop them up in the back end and for that reason this faction is incredibly unique and fun to play again for the people who don't care about uh about old missile units number 11 perhaps even my favorite too and that is Norska. Norska is a complete glass cannon faction that focuses on rushing the enemy. They have high mobility. They have access to all kinds, perhaps even the most diverse set of monsters. You can see their own version of a giant right here alongside a very powerful mammoth as well. And their front line is formidable, not very heavily armored. In fact, really not armored at all on any of them uh, in particular. But what they do well is they have insane killing power. They also lack, uh, they, uh, sorry, they also lack a lot of missile units. Of course, they do have a few options, but they typically are closer range. They typically are very powerful, but again, require closer range. So I don't really consider them as like a ranged faction at all. Uh, they don't have any anything resembling artillery. They do have cavalry, of course. They do have chariots. They do have very powerful legendary lords, and their monsters is really their shining point. They have so many different options here, whether it's these highly mobile wolfkin, whether it's these other, <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's just their highly mobile frontline units over here, which do a damn good job the marauders and then of course what you know what anchors their front line these massive mammoth units and and even the giants to a lesser extent as well they even have access to dragons and um and mana cores over here and and their own version of trolls of which these are the regular ones right here but they do have ice trolls which brings me on to their different mechanics so the way that this faction is completely different on the battlefield well, maybe not completely different but they are certainly focused on rushing on on mobility and on killing power they do not have a lot of staying power they will not survive a long battle but what they do well is that they actually will chase down units very very well they have a they have their own mechanic called uh, i don't exactly know what it's called but it's this ice mechanic which essentially slows down the enemy units so any sort of unit that is routing or trying to run away, uh, they can they can take care of that quite easily. On the campaign map, they also have a very unique mechanic as well because they're not a they're not a horde faction, but they're also not your standard faction that just stays in one place the whole time. They're kind of both. They're kind of both, which brings up a very unique sort of experience because you'll find that after you consolidate your main province homeland uh, in the Great North. 
after that, when you start to venture out into the other parts of the world, you won't really find yourself ever, you know, making another settlement anywhere else. I mean, maybe every once in a while it'll make sense, but for the most part, it'll be mostly raiding, pillaging, and uh, in raising settlements, which is oddly very satisfying. And I have definitely, I was definitely not expecting to really care for this, um, for this faction, but after playing them, you know, quite a few times now, I think that they are my favorite faction. Extreme mobility, extreme killing power on the front line, not only with their front line units, but also with their monsters makes for a very fun experience number 12 bretonia bretonia is a very interesting faction in the sense that they have some of the best cavalry options they also have some unique cavalry options up here they're actually considered monsters in a sense but basically flying pegasuses um but they're combined with an incredibly weak and independable front line their front line units break fast they break early and they break often but they do typically come back they are very cheap on the front line but if their lord whoever their legendary lord is dies it's it's game over for these guys as well however their cavalry units are incredibly eclectic maybe some of the most diverse cavalry options in the game as you'd imagine it being bretonia the whole you know cavalry faction essentially and they have some perhaps perhaps some of the best if you do consider the pegasus units as cavalry which i don't see any reason not to they are damn good at that their sort of their sort of play style is very mobile but they do sort of scatter around into very weird and awkward situations on the battlefield it's it's difficult to describe. It's difficult. It's difficult to describe. But they're very heavily reliant on, on, on a very crude way of doing hammer and anvil tactics with their very powerful cavalry, but their very weak front lines. So their their front lines, like I said, don't have very much staying power. So it's almost like you have to time everything properly, and then hope for the best. Now on the campaign map, they actually have one of the best economies in the game. They love to expand. So if you are not the type that likes to build a massive empire, this is certainly not the one for you. But if you are the person who likes to start off very small and then exp and then paint the map your colors this is a great faction to play with because they will start to steamroll quite a bit and they do have a pretty fun experience on the battlefield although i would say it's not it's personally not my favorite faction to be fair um, but i have enjoyed playing them in the past they do a few options for artillery so they can play a little bit more defensively making the enemy come to them but they're not going to win you the battle with their artillery so they're just okay in these in these field trebuchets over here um, not very unique, but serviceable and, and does their purpose, which essentially brings the enemy into them. And then they have a bunch of, and then they do have a few options on the front line that actually will not break. Those are the ones that you really want to get towards. But their, I suppose their sort of um, advantage there is that their front line units are very cheap, extremely cheap. Both the archers and and these uh, and these spearmen, just you know your stock standard front line units, relatively very cheap, big in number, don't have very good staying power, terrible leadership will certainly not win you any battles, but that's not their job. Their job is to hold them in there so that the cavalry can get around or, or above if they're flying around. Number 13, the Wood Elves. The Wood Elves are similar to the High Elves in the sense that they have very, 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 very small unit counts, perhaps even less than the uh, than their than their High Elf counterparts. But they do have the same sort of feeling as well in the sense that they're very elite units. They cost a lot, they take a while to recruit, and they do have some pretty damn uh, unique units as well. Now, this faction is primarily focused on ranged firepower in the form of these missile units, these typically bow units, and can be anchored by very, 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 very scary treeman monsters and even has access to some forest dragons over here as well as the each tree can over here doing their job it is an extremely 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 highly mobile arm uh, army that has their own sort of um, identity with stealth with 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 mobility and with firepower from range on the front line they do okay they're not very heavily armored they do have decent killing power they do have okay staying power but they're cer that's certainly not their um their 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 strength their strength is in their mobility their strength is in their ranged firepower and they are incredibly fast incredibly incredibly fast and like we saw they do have a few flying units which even add more to that as well as uh as, sorry these treekins over here as well um, you know, anchoring a front line and typically going to be well-rounded by their eternal guard or sorry, not their eternal guard, but their, uh, their glade guard. Where are they? I think they're right here. Yes, indeed. They're one of their only shielded units are going to be kind of the mainstay, but as you can see, their units, not very big. So if you find yourself, you know, getting, getting surrounded or sorry, in an engagement with like the greenskins or something like that, getting surrounded is going to be a humongous issue because they just don't have enough units to deal with all the other units. So they have to be very clever in the way that they micro around. It's very 
very micro intensive army and i've actually really enjoyed it for that reason i i usually don't uh i usually don't enjoy ranged um armies but this one pretty damn fun because of the skill that's uh, that's required involved in order to be successful on the battlefield on the campaign map they are kind of similar to norska in the sense that they don't really expand too far out of their main homeland territory they do most of their upgrades there and everything in their in their city building there uh, every once in a while you'll take you know you'll take another settlement but it's mostly going out raiding and raising uh, enemy settlements which is really really fun in my opinion um, and then the, and then their homelands like pretty defensible they also do have a different mechanic with their economy their economy is not all that strong and is also further hampered by the amber mechanic which is essentially this like very scarce resource in a sense especially in the beginning of the game later on it becomes relatively easy to get especially through alliances and whatnot but um but at the beginning of the game, you're very hamstring, very hamstrung. Is that is that right? Or hamstringed? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you're very hamstrung by the fact that you know your more powerful units are going to require this amber mechanic, uh, or sorry, going uh, to going to cost amber, and also your tech upgrades for the better tech upgrades, you will require amber as well. So it's a very um, you know you, you really have to specialize what you want to do and how you're going to play this army. But I would strongly suggest it, especially for the people who liked the more uh, micro intensive type uh, type armies and who like a kind of glass cannon but a glass cannon from range in a sense number 14 the beastmen the beastmen are incredibly mobile big in number and a horde faction to boot they are actually surprisingly very fun to play i did not think i was going to enjoy this faction either but i pleasantly was surprised on both the campaign experience and on the battlefield experience they are maybe the fastest uh, faction in the game with these senegors which essentially act as the cavalry although they're kind of half half man half well i think horse um more importantly they move very fast they also have incredibly fun units to, to use like these minotaurs over here which are just absolutely destroy any infantry in their way they are a blast to use and they even have their own version of artillery with this saigor that actually throws a massive rock pretty much all the way across the map he has he has massive range but that's their only option for artillery they do have some ranged missile options for just your stock standard uh bows um not certainly not a uh, a high point for these guys but their main advantages is in being very fast, swarming the enemy with their numbers, and making the enemy make mistakes by just putting the pressure on very early. They're certainly a rush faction, similar to Norska, but with different tools, and they even have some flying units as well, of course, to harass units as they kind of move away. And their speed makes it so that whenever they get another enemy to break or route, they can chase them down and chase them off the map pretty much almost always, assuming that they have the numbers for which is another one of their strengths, so they should not have any issues with that. They also have access to some of the Chaos units. These Chaos spawn right here, or the equivalent of... Do, do their job on the front line and they have some good killing power but it's really the minotaurs that are the big killing power of this other than that it's mainly very big numbers in the front line not the best units in the front line you know they're not necessarily going to win you the battle they're also not going to lose you the battle they're not they're not terrible like zombies or anything like that um but they're just okay they're uh, they're just okay no more no less and not you know not a strength not a weakness but very cheap, which is very, very nice. Now on the campaign map, they play as a complete horde faction. They stealth in, they stealth out, they get to pick and choose their battles, which is really, really nice. They get to go pretty much wherever they want because they're, they're, you know, their default stance is to kind of be unseen in a sense. And they are mobile because they do all their city building just with their one Lord. They never take over a city. They can only raise, they can only, or sorry, their, their, their focus is on raising and raiding. Um, and they're just like kind of a destructive faction action maybe not the most fleshed out campaign mechanics um but with the sfo mod i think that it really brings it first full full circle and adds a bunch to their roster of which these minotaurs with great weapons are are, are a phenomenal uh, addition to that and they even have some access to uh to their own sort of giant over here as well though giants maybe not the best units of all time in fact the cygors are the, really the ones to go with because they can do they they perform pretty damn well in melee and of course they do have that range weapon as well and 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 they have maybe the best cavalry option or i think what's considered a cavalry option in the game in these razor gores right here they will absolutely decimate any sort of a front line approach and they are they are a joy to see when the front lines of of mostly these kind of uh, meat shield units are engaged and then you throw them in there and then flank some senegores around the back 
Number 15, the Warlords of Chaos, the heavy metal faction. This faction is focused on the some of the most powerful frontline units, a, an extremely heavy armor with extreme killing power on top of that. Their, their drawback or their lack is in ranged firepower, except for, oh, that could be maybe one of the most powerful uh, artillery pieces in the whole game. But other than that, they have absolutely no range. They do have, they do have one, one, uh, one unit of skirmish cav that can uh, fire bows in, but but very rarely does do I ever see anyone use that, and I don't think I've ever used it uh, myself. They have a lot of unique units in the sense that um, they have a lot of killing power on the front line. They don't have much mobility. They are relatively slow, except for a few of these marauder sort of um, horsemen over here, which are not going to be used too much outside of the first, you know, opening turns of the game. And then also, of course, these uh, these war dogs over here as well. But again, not a state, not a staple or not a center point of this army. So they do have a little bit of a drawback in the campaign map because they are limited in their mobility. So if a unit does break and uh, and they can't really chase them down that unit's going to come back and they'll have to beat them again the good thing about that is is that they do have some of the best options for that in extremely heavy armor with extreme killing power as we just said uh, they can hold their own the front line and they typically don't really break uh, until maybe like the very last second they also have damn good choices for legendary lords a lot of magic and a lot of options for uh, for heroes as well, which can hold their own. And of course, they actually have some good options for chariots too. So their their whole play style on the battlefield is win the front line. Win the front line in a very devastating, kind of boring but grindy-ish way. Uh, I know that some people out there are going to like that. Some people out there are going to hate that. And I should say that their campaign is probably the least fleshed out out of any campaign in this whole in this whole series. Now, personally speaking, I actually still enjoy it because I do enjoy the the Horde faction experience. But uh, it is worth stating that uh, they don't necessarily have the most well thought out mechanics. It is uh, it is as simple as going from settlement to settlement, raiding and raising, and you know recruiting more of your army, which is fun. But for the people looking for a more in depth experience, this is actually not the these. This is certainly not the faction for you on the campaign map, and I think it's also one of the cheapest uh, faction DLCs. Uh, but if you like having the killing power, if you like watching frontline engagements go, typically go your way as well, while maybe even pounding them from the back end with, uh, with these very powerful cannons, and, and including a few monsters in the mix, this is the faction for you if that's the case. I would say most people don't really seem to care for this faction. Uh, I found a, I found some joy, uh, some enjoyment in this one, especially when using their monsters like these uh, these these Dragon Ogre Shagroths, I believe is their name. Yeah, Dragon Ogre, uh, Ogre Shagroth, and then even their own version of a giant, and of course the Chaos Spawn, and uh, and then and then a bunch of different unique sets of their frontline infantry. That does create a fun experience. Um, however, I would say the biggest drawback with these guys is their campaign. And with that said, and, and with that said, that's going to wrap up this whole series here. Like I said, in the future, I'll do a much more in depth on each and every faction themselves, going over different strategies and whatnot on what they kind of do well with or what I found uh, to work very well, and also maybe things that I haven't found to work very well. Um, but for now, just wanted to do a quick few minutes on each and every faction, kind of outlaying, uh, or sorry, outlining their strengths, outlining their weaknesses, and talking a little bit about their campaign play so that you could perhaps make a better, more educated decision on which faction to uh, to invest your time into. As I know from experience, that first initial uh, screen where you select is a little bit overwhelming. So with that said, I'm going to close this one off now. I want to wish you well, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.